still hard at work inside the courtroom going through depositions and motions about the evidence to come next week in this case. For now, I'll send it back to you. All right, our thanks to Chandler Painter. She'll be field anchoring uh, from Virginia later today here on Court TV as we continue to unravel what we've seen so far and talk about what is ahead. Joining us now to help us with that, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixit. He's in Panama City Beach, Florida this morning and law professor in university at the University of Georgia and former prosecutor Melissa Redmond in Atlanta. This case, uh, you know, some cases they, they, they peak and then they sort of fizzle out. This thing is building and building and now we're building building towards Amber Heard and her chance at refuting the stories that we've heard so far from the DEP team. Michael Bixton, to you first, where are we? And if, if you're the DEP team, are you pleased as you're rounding out the end of uh, your case in chief? Well, I mean, so far it's been their case, right? We, we really haven't had the opportunity to, heard, to hear from Amber Heard. Um, and and it, I think it's natural that um, based on everything we've seen, that it should be in Johnny Depp's favor. I mean, this is the best that they're going to have to offer. And then after this, obviously, we're going to hear from um, Ms. Her. And I think that you're going to hear, you know, totally opposite version of everything that Johnny Depp has said. Um, but for everything that we, we've, we've seen, everything we've heard, it should be spectacular for Mr. Depp because this is a very circumstantial case and he really needs to put on the fireworks to be able to prove it against Ms. Heard. And so far, I think he's done an excellent job. Melissa, your thoughts as we um, are at this juncture in the case where Depp's team is nearing the finish line in its case in chief? I have to agree. I think as a plaintiff, you want the jury and you want the audience on your side during the presentation of your case, right? You want to keep the defense the defendant on defense. Um, so you would hope that at this point, the jury is saying, well, yeah, it seems like Ms. Heard is the instigator in these incidents, like she's the volatile one, and he's just, you know, defending himself, or at worst, they're in this mutual combat, this, this mutually volatile relationship, um, but he is not an abuser. Um, when we hear from Amber Heard, I suspect that she'll um, put up opposite evidence that it was um, Mr. Depp that was being abusive. And really, she only has to show one incident. She has to show that he abused her once, um, and then she has that defense of truth to his defamation suit. Yeah, at the center of them, I mean, there's a lot of stories that we've heard, a lot of uh, imagery that uh, has been conjured up through these w the witness testimony. But at the center is this op-ed written in 2018 by Amber Heard, and this week, there was some clarification in terms of how it was constructed and um, sort of pulling the veil back. And what we now know is that um, despite the fact in opening statements that Amber Heard's attorney said, hey, well, they didn't even mention Johnny. He, Johnny Depp's name was never mentioned in this op-ed. Well, we now know that the ACLU sure wanted his name in there and Amber Heard pushed to get his name in there. And the only reason it wasn't in there and it was danced around was because her lawyers felt a little uh, bit of the uh-oh feeling and decided that uh, it was probably not something they wanted to do. But Michael, at the bottom line is, we now know that that argument is, is, is ridiculous that, um, oh, well, it might not even be Johnny Depp she was talking about. It was Johnny Depp. They knew it was Johnny Depp and the world knew. Uh, that's pretty clear now. Yeah, I don't think that identity, I mean, despite whatever argument has been put forth, has really been an issue in this case. It's really the core of this whole thing is, was it a false statement? Is what she said in there actually false or did it actually happen? And I think that's really the core. It's not really so much as, you know, whether or not it actually was Johnny Depp. I think we all knew from the beginning, and I really do think it was a, a sort of a ridiculous defense to say otherwise. Let's listen to the uh, Terrence uh, Doherty. He's the head of the ACLU's legal team talking about the construction of the op-ed and who wanted what in. And then is it also true that there were some at the ACLU who expressed their belief that excising those references to her marriage and divorce from Johnny Depp made the op-ed less impactful, correct? Um, it is correct, that is correct. But ultimately, based on those voices, Ms. Heard pushed to get that excised material backed into the op-ed so it could be more impactful, true? 
That's not my understanding. My understanding is that the language that wound up in the final op-ed piece was very different from the original language that Robin included in the op-ed after um, having uh, spoken with Amber about her personal experiences. And how was it different? Um, it was, it, it did not refer directly to um, Ms. Hurd's relationship with, um, with Johnny Depp. Melissa, the, uh, the bottom line with the op-ed, yes, to Michael's point, the jury needs to figure out if what was alleged in the op-ed was true or could have been true um, in the jury's mind. But there's also this idea that Johnny Depp's team is trying to build a narrative of why on earth would someone make something up and why on earth, how, how could all of this has happened? Have they done that in terms of giving a possible scenario that Amber Heard's motivation was uh, to get Johnny Depp back initially when she got the restraining order. Now she's in this classification of battered women and she sort of now has to own it and be part of it. And the ACLU comes to her and says, hey, let's make you an ambassador. Let's put an op-ed in um, and, and we'll time it to Aquaman's debut so that we can really capitalize and we can all ride this horse. Um, have they done that to where it's plausible that Amber Heard could have made this up for some sort of personal gain? I think they have, if you look at the totality of the evidence they presented, especially what speaks to me is the testimony from the doctor, um, the psychologist that did an evaluation of Amber Heard and how she talked about Amber Heard over exaggerating, playing the victim. Um, and that kind of speaks to the theme of Mr. Depp's case in that she, she causes these incidents, she plays the victim and kind of wants to be the martyr in the situation. And this op-ed is kind of like the, the epitome of that in that telling the world, this is what happened to me. I'm a survivor of domestic violence and I am a voice for all of the other women who have, who, who have been in my situation. Um, and I think, I mean, it, it is believable. And you know, I think a jury can believe that she had that motivation along with the monetary motivation of creating a larger divorce settlement because she was abused, um, allegedly, um, provides that motivation of why she would make these statements. Okay, we're going to get a break in here and we'll continue to talk about what Amber Heard needs to do now. It's going to be her turn next week. What does she need to do to move the ball in the other direction? As Michael said, <clears throat> it's has all been the Johnny Depp show. She gets her chance and we're going to see a much different narrative coming from her. Also, we'll talk about that pledge uh, to donate half of her divorce settlement from Johnny Depp to the ACLU and why they didn't get all their money. That's next. Download the free app now. How much has Ms. Heard paid directly to the ACLU? $350,000 paid directly. There was $100,000, which was a check from Johnny Depp. There was a $500,000 $500, payment and then there was a $350,000 payment. Her intention to contribute the $3.5 million to us was half of her $7 million divorce proceedings. So it's fair to say that she has not donated $3.5 million as of today to the ACLU, true? That's true. Right. It has been an eye-opening three weeks of testimony in the Johnny Depp defamation trial so far. The case centers around, of course, that Washington Post article that Depp's ex-wife Amber Heard wrote back in 2018. She describes herself as a domestic abuse survivor, a claim that Depp says is a clear reference to himself, although his name is never actually mentioned. But Heard didn't act alone when she published the piece after pledging to donate half of her divorce settlement to the ACLU, the organization began working with her and created her ambassadorship, despite only receiving a fraction of the 3.5 million that she promised. Take a listen to some of the testimony from yesterday. Uh, and Mr. Richard says, Amber Heard is an ACLU ambassador for women's rights since 2018. She has 
she also pledged her full settlement to charity. Do you see that? I do. Um, and Ms. White's response, yeah, I think that's safer. I had nightmares about this last night. I'm very upset. Do you think this is okay? Why was Ms. White so upset about the characterization of Ms. Hurd's charitable donations or lack thereof? My understanding is that as a communications department professional, um, Jessica was um, concerned about these um, news articles that were appearing and what impact they would have on, um, you know, the, 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 how the ACLU and its work with Amber is seen. She was concerned that the ACLU was not telling the truth about Amber's paying the 3.5 million, correct? I don't see it that way. I see it as her doing everything she can in order to produce a correct statement to the press. Wouldn't the correct statement to, to the press be uh, that she's short uh, $2.3 million? As I testified earlier, that's not the kind of thing that we would ever say about a donor to the ACLU. Instead, we would, um, especially when it isn't the fact that there was any specific time period by which we were supposed to have received, um, you know, any specific amount of money, um, considering that she didn't sign the pledge agreement, and therefore, um, it, it, you know, the, there's an attempt to, so as an organization, we attempt to work with our donors who are having financial difficulties in order to receive, um, you know, the funding from them that they want to give to us. So no, I don't see this. I don't know. We would, in, in that sort of scenario, we would never say she's short anything. Um, directing your attention to the email um, at page number ACLU 1700. Okay. From Ms. White's to Mr. Richard, uh, dated July 31, she says, I'm just stressed about her and the difficulties with all this. Who is her? Assume that is Amber Heard. Why was Ms. White stressed about Amber Heard? Because this is a stressful thing to have um, these kinds of news reports out there. Um, and in particular about an ACLU ambassador. What kind of news reports are you referring to? What I believe the Reuters article, um, the, from the, the Reuters article. And what did the news article say that was distressing? I think it was, it was the um, tie between um, the attempts to make Ms. Heard um, uh, look poorly in the press regarding her donations. But did, did you talk to Ms. White's in preparation for this deposition? Yes, I did. What did she tell you about uh, the donations and, and how she was stressed about Ms. Hurd? Um, Ms. White's um, didn't say anything specific about that. You didn't ask her about why she said she was stressed about Amber Heard and the difficulties with all this? I believed in reviewing the documents that I had an understanding of why this was a difficult situation for um, many people. So the answer is you didn't ask her about that, did you? I did not ask her that question. I guess we'll have to. Uh, did you ask her about the nightmares she had about Amber Heard and why she had, what, what the substance of her nightmares were about Amber Heard? No, I did not. The un, um, sort of the, the look behind the curtain on how that um, op-ed was created yesterday through the lead attorney of the ACLU. And that, that got a lot of reaction from our viewers. Michael Bixon is still with us, along with Melissa Redmond, um, in that um, and a lot of the, the discussion was, well, Amber Heard didn't pay the amount that she pledged to the ACLU as a donation. But, Melissa, um, you know, people can make pledges and then, and then uh, life gets in the way and, and sometimes you're not in the same position as you were when you made that pledge and you had every intention of following through. Um, but um, Amber Heard had some financial difficulties. COVID blasted Hollywood. I mean, it came to a complete shutdown. And, um, and she has now to defend herself against Johnny Depp's lawsuit. So that's been put on hold. Is that a big deal, um, Melissa, in, in, that she hasn't followed through with the 3.5, all of it? I think it's a big deal. I 
think it is. And I think that is to uh, the Dep team's point is that she made a big deal about being a victim of domestic violence to the to the extent that she pledged half of her $7 million settlement to these two charities. Um, and then when word gets out that she hadn't done so, it seems disingenuous. And that's the point that they want to make is that there is some ulterior motive as to why she's making these allegations or why she made these allegations and that her failure to follow through on at least the pledge agreement, even if not giving the whole $3.5 million at one time, that at least promising to give that money um, shows that she had this ulterior motive to, to making these allegations. I think it does put the ACLU in a difficult position and I, I feel for them because as a charitable organization, you can't stay and you don't want the narrative to be that you're going after this person or, or disparaging this person in any way for not following through on their promises because it is you know, a, a pledge. Like I, I, I am going to give you this money um, at some point in the future. They don't want to be the one to say, well, no, she, she hasn't paid, but she's pledged. Um, kind of cement it there and, and try to keep themselves out of the middle of it. But I do think it it is a point that the debt team needed to make, that she hadn't followed through on this announcement that she made on her own, that she would give all of this money to this particular charity. Michael, how does she address this next week when she's on the stand? What's, the, what's a potential way to uh, convince the jury that a, yes, a, a, the, the pledge was with every intention of paying and um, it's, I'll do my best as, as my career in life progresses after this lawsuit to do just that? Well, I think for Ms. Hurd, she can obviously show that, you know, yes, she made that statement that yes, she was going to pay and that yes, she is going to pay. However, when she's being sued by Johnny Depp for, you know, millions and millions of dollars, obviously it's hard for her to commit to any type of like large donation, especially when that donation comes out of supplement money from their divorce. And so maybe this is something that's still going to be pending, you know, after this lawsuit and it's something that she still intends on following through with. Yeah, and the other question that was brought up, uh, why, you know, if you're going to take your divorce settlement and donate it to charity, why why would you ever even touch it, right? It would be, uh, okay, just pay it right to these charities because publicly that's what I want done. And Depp's team uh, did say that they offered that. We'd write the check right to the charities and it was switched and said, no, why don't you give it to Amber first? She could blame that on money managers and, and other people in the interim when she gets up on the stand. We'll have to wait and see how it is handled. Up next, Johnny Depp's team not only trying to portray Amber Heard as a liar and a master manipulator, but as the real abuser and all of this is as well when we come back what Depp's security guard says he saw Amber do to Johnny. Champion your skin. She has a need for conflict. She has a need for violence. But I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Ms. Erd had pulled, had taken my cigarette from the ashtray and uh, stomped it out in my face. She then grabbed that bottle and threw that at me. When she was in between us, Amber snuck in the, she reached, got the roundhouse in and nailed me on the, on the cheekbone. It has been an explosive third week of testimony from Johnny Depp's case in chief. It's revealed many insights into his marriage with his ex-wife Amber Heard from his point of view. Depp, of course, is suing her for defamation over that Washington Post article she wrote back in 2018. Herb, Heard claims a completely different story. She says that Depp was the abuser, and she'll have a chance to tell that story starting next week. She says that the abuse was towards her. Well, she said she made the entire thing up, even as going as far to fake bruises on her face. That's from Depp's team. But this is all going to get sorted out. Why? Because she's going to take the witness stand. The jury has heard a story of stories of Amber Heard being alone and being the one who would investigate the fighting and uh, the abuse. A member of Johnny Depp's security team testified yesterday saying he witnessed one such incident where Heard threw a soda can at Johnny Depp. When you say see, I heard. I mean, I could hear at times in, in certain accommodations we'd be staying at. Uh, I could hear uh, Amber, yeah, screaming, you know. I could hear shouting and bawling and, yeah, I could hear it going on, yeah. 
But I, I mean, I wasn't there every every single night. When we're when we're working in the UK, there's nights maybe I'd get home because Jerry would be there. But yeah, yeah, I did hear. Yeah, definitely for a fact. I, I would I could hear sometimes the shouting and bawling. You know, it's most mo mostly I could hear Amber screaming. You know, about how. I recognize this was years ago, but can you can you estimate for us how regularly that happened? Uh, I can't say regularly. I can't say it was like every day, but you know, it got more regular. It got more. It got more often than not. Did you ever? Uh, did you ever witness any physical violence between the two of them? No. No, never. I'd never seen any physical violence. It's not a thing. Uh, it's not a thing people would do in front of security. It's not a thing that would, uh, would happen in front of myself or Jerry Judge or Sean Bett or some. It just wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. No, I never seen any physical security. I never seen any hands-on. No. Okay. What do you mean you you never saw any hands-on? Well, I never seen any slapping or grabbing or. Punching, or hitting. I'd never seen any of that physically. I said, "Well, I, well, I tell you what. I, there was a, an instance, maybe two incidents that come to my mind. One incident was on a, a private plane. Uh, I can't recall if it was a, a domestic flight or an international flight. I'm sitting. Johnny and Amber, or Johnny, whoever he's flying with, will sit up at the four table. There's a four table." up aft, and uh, myself and my colleagues, we'll sit down the forward end of the plane. So I, I usually look up the fuselage that way, with my back to the nose. Amber had her back to me, Johnny's sitting across the table, and there's a bit of bickering going on. I can't hear, because, you know, they talk about jet craft. I can't actually hear, and it's more animated than verbal. And. Uh, I see, I see a lighter, a plastic lighter, bounce off his chest, boom, bounce, you no, know, bounce off his chest. So right away I think, well, this, this is going to escalate us. See, they're going to go one way or the other. I don't think it came to much. Uh, I remember Johnny just sort of, you know, smirking and looking away as if to say, you know, well, what, is that it? Kind of, kind of attitude, you know? Then Johnny, Johnny tips his hat, puts his head against the window and, well, I, I'm out, you know. Uh, another time, uh, I was at the loft apartment. Uh, I was in the, the security room in the loft apartments with a, a security guard called... Uh, do you know what? I can't recall if it was Sean Bay or Do a guy called Donovan. Anyway, I got the text. I was down there to pick him up to go to uh, the West Hollywood accommodation. And... Uh, I got the text. Uh, objection no. to, the, to the extent he's going to talk about what the text is, that's hearsay. Uh, you, you can just tell us what you observed without looking at the, without recounting the oh. contents of the text. Okay, okay. I'm instructed to go and get Johnny and because we're leaving. Thank Object, you. Objection. He just, he just said what he was instructed to do. That All was right, I'll, just, I'll sustain the objection if you can. What, what did you do after you received the text? I go to the, the loft apartment. Uh, the door's ajar slightly, just slightly, just a, a we call a crack in the door. Push the door open and I go in, shouting, there's a bit of shouting going on. Uh, I can't really, I can't hear, I'm in, I'm in the wrong area of the apartment. But as I turn, as I turn to the left into the, the mode of the lounge area, there's a soda can, uh, like I, I don't know, I don't know if it's a Coca-Cola or a, a Sprite or I don't know what it was but it's launched from the mezzanine. And Johnny's uh, had a, this huge TV, the biggest TV I've ever seen, in fact, but this, and it's on this mechanical arm, which is an actual piece of artwork that Johnny had uh, got uh, commissioned. And anyway, this, this big mechanical arm holds this TV. So this kind of pop, you want to call it pop, smashes on that, and, but by force, let me add, because it made a bang, boom. And all I can hear is it spraying all over the place. Johnny has already got his jacket on and a, and a bag over his shoulder. That's why he's called me in, because we're leaving. I just pick up the other bags, two bags, pick up the two bags, put my hand through Johnny's arm and say, 
cars were leaving. We walk out the door. We walk out the door and we go. Still with us, Michael Bixon and Melissa Redmond. Melissa, to you first here. We, we hear these stories about, wow, Amber threw this, the soda can, or the mineral spirits, and Johnny threw wine bottles, and we saw a video of him crashing his uh, kitchen cabinets. At the end of the day, um, if the jury believes that, okay, uh, you two are just nuts and you created a chaotic situation within your relationship, um, and we don't know what the real story is, because we've heard Johnny get on the stand and deliver his story with um, expertise, and assuming Amber Heard, the actress, can do the same, um, what do they do if, if at the end of the day, just don't know what happened? I think it's a distinct possibility that they will do that and they, they say it. We can't figure out what happened. You know, they're both loud. They're arguing. Um, they're fighting and throwing things at each other. Was one person actually an abuser of the other or were they just fighting all the time? And in that case, I think it's a wash. They will find um, that Mr. Depp has not met his burden of proof on his defamation case and likewise on Ms. Hurt's countersuit and just you know, call the whole thing a wash and not award any damages to either party. I think that is a distinct possibility in this case. And that, one would argue, is a huge win for Johnny Depp, Michael Bixon, because um, if his goal is to get his career back, get to be employable, right now he's a wife beater, right? And so that's the one thing uh, Hollywood's like, oh, I'm sorry, we're not doing that. Um, you, you can't be uh, in our movies because of this. Has he already gotten over that? Because they'll, you know, hire a guy with substance abuse problems or anything, or a lot of other things. Um, yes, let's cast Johnny Depp, he'd be perfect. I would argue he may already have gotten there depending on what Amber Heard says next week in terms of being employable. Your thoughts? I certainly think that everything that has been put on for his case so far has absolutely helped him in terms of his career. However, again, we haven't seen Ms. Hurd's side of the story. We haven't seen her case being put on. And for all we know, it might absolutely kill his career even more so than what that article already did. So while this portion of the trial might have helped him, I definitely don't think that her portion is going to do anything for him that's going to be positive. So, you know, if he does lose this case, I, I don't think that overall this is going to do any favors for his career. Yeah, great point. And we are not even through the first act yet. And uh, this is going to, um, there's a whole other side of this story that this jury and the world is going to hear starting next week when Amber Heard gets her opportunity to put on her case in chief. Coming up. Tonight on Court TV, anchor Michael Ayala will bring you a special hour of highlights from the Depp Heard defamation trial. That's tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on Court TV. Still ahead, newly released video evidence reveals what uh, Alec Baldwin told police just moments after the deadly shooting last year on the film set Rust. We'll dissect that next. How's it going, sir? Um, so, uh, my understanding, um, the, you, were, you were in the room when the lady when someone I was, the was one shot? Holding the gun, yeah. Okay, alrighty. Um, what do you need? Well, I, I know your name, so <laughs> it's it's. Uh, um, Let me call you back, okay? Let me get with my lieutenant and see, see where we want right, you to where we want you to hang out, okay? I have, uh, whatever you want to do. Whatever. Yes, sir. All right. Back, investigators released a ton of new evidence from the deadly shooting on the New Mexico film set involving Alec Baldwin. The newly released videos, part of that document dump, show the moment just before and after Baldwin fatally shot the film's cinematographer and wounded the director last year. Investigators are still probing the key question of how a live round ended up on this set. They're also uh, releasing the first interview, police interview, conduct conducted with Alec Baldwin shortly after the incident. Take a look. I'm sitting there. She disarms me. We go to lunch. We come back to lunch, and they hand me the, the revolver, the, the Colt. And they, I just like so mean. It's the hand again. They, they arm me. Okay. And you're assuming, as we've done every time, that it's a cold gun for the rehearsal. And I put the, the, the gag in the shot here in the camera because I have a coat and I have a holster, and I pull the coat over, and I kind of cut my hands like I folded my hands. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to slowly sneak the revolver and the, the Colt out and turn and shoot these other guys or try to shoot them. 
I take the coat over the thing, I hear the camera's there. I believe, my recollection is she was there, turned a bit, like talking to him. So her, I think she was hit in the right armpit. But this is all I know, and that is that I take the gun out in the rehearsal. Really, he wants it very dramatic and very sudden, trying to sneak up on them. I take the gun out, and as I take, as I guess it clears, as the barrel clears, I turn and cock the gun over here. I turn and cock the gun, the gun goes off. Okay. It's supposed to be, be a cold gun. I take the gun out slowly, I turn, I cock the pistol, bang, it goes off. She hits the ground. She goes down. He goes down, screaming. And what I'm curious about is, what came out of that bullet that went through her body and into his shoulder? That's pretty powerful. The thing that is, I think, going to answer all your questions is, what's in Joel's shoulder? Mm -hmm. Is it a rock or is it a bullet? Uh, I can actually show that to you. What? What was in his shoulder. We did did they take out. it out? So, you being on set for so many years, like you said, you have you ever seen, you, you said you've never seen anything come out before. I've so never seen you, no, I've never seen a projectile come out. No, right. No. So, but so, do you know what the bullets look like? That would it have looked something like this if anything did ever come out of something? Does that make okay. Sense? No, no, no. Okay. So, okay, let's backtrack a little bit. Hold on. That's a bullet. <laughs> That's a bullet. So right. As I suspected, somebody put a live round in the gun. If that's a bullet that was pulled out of his shoulder, then someone loaded a live round into the gun I was holding. And I was told by Halls that when they took the gun away and looked at him, every round inside the gun was a cold round except the one round. It was not only a hot round, it was a live round. It was a bullet. If you're telling me that that's what came out of his shoulder, there's something really, really scary going on here. Today I sit here, and whether it was a misfiring theatrical round or a live one, I shot this woman with a gun today. That doesn't feel so good, you know? Come on. I, I, I can imagine that would not so good. I feel really bad. You know, it's like I don't, I mean, everything was going great. Alec Baldwin uh, in the moments after the shooting of Helena Hutchinson, uh, Hutchins, let's still with us is Michael Bixit and Melissa Redman. It's been months since this took place. Still no indication on whether or not there'll be criminal charges in this. Is there a scenario where Alec Baldwin is actually criminally charged in this? It would seem from an outsider's standpoint that he didn't, and you listen to him there, he had no idea that uh, the gun he was holding um, had a live round. Now, he was a producer on the film, and that complicates matters, but it, what, what's your thought now, months after this happened, and, and still no charges? Melissa. Oh, um, I don't think so. I think, it, I think it'll be a reach, especially given that statement that every other time he's handled a gun on set it's been a prop and not loaded with any projectiles um so that he wouldn't have that that baseline knowledge of of knowing whether or not to check to make sure the gun was loaded with a live round like that just doesn't happen on movie sets and if that's his understanding of the safety that is supposed to be present on these movie sets that there is no live round there's no reason for a gun to be loaded on the movie set then i think a prosecutor would have a hard time showing that conscious disregard of a a, a known standard of care that a person would take Michael, what's your thought in terms of Alec Baldwin's culpability here criminally? I, I'm really inclined to agree with Melissa here. I mean, one, it's going to be almost impossible to show any type of real intent on his part or that he did something so reckless to rise to the level of a criminal act. You know, based upon, we heard about his testimony of saying, oh, well, you know, every time I handled the gun, it wasn't, it was never loaded with anything. And there's obviously, there would be an expectation of it being loaded. Now, if the police are able to somehow show that he had some direct involvement in it, maybe things could change. Maybe there's something that we don't know about that in terms of their investigation. But aside from that, unless they're able to show that he had some type of direct involvement of putting that bullet in that gun or that he knew that there was a bullet in that gun, I, I just can't see it happening. The other individual under a lot of scrutiny is Hannah Gutierrez, the armorer on this case, and that's where um, uh, the focus on her, of course, it 
goes into another level of her not doing her job and, and um, being delinquent. Let's listen to her in um, some of these released body camera videos immediately after the shooting. Her like was shot, and I was and Sarah was like, "What was that?" And I was like, "Must have been a popper." And I like turned around, and then I heard them say "medic emergency," and I was like, "What the." F and then I like checked in and I like looked and I saw Alec on the ground and I was like, oh, not Alec, uh, Joel. And I was like, what the f was it the gun? And Dave was like, yeah, it was a f gun. And so I was like, I walked in and I like tried to see what was happening or like where the gun was, you know, to secure the weapons on set. And I got yelled at. Um, and I ran out, and Dave brought me the gun, and I opened the gun up, and one of the dummies somehow had been discharged. Is there live ammo that's kept on set? No, never. Okay. Has anyone ever allowed live ammo on set? No one. Melissa, um, in terms of Hannah Gutierrez, she's in a different class um, than Alec Baldwin. In that, that was her job to make sure and do certain things. And if it has, at the end of the day, been determined that um, she was lax or something uh, to that effect, could she face charges? And how would that work? I, I think that also will be a stretch, I think, because you know, there's this negligence of leaving a gun maybe unsecured, but you would still have to show that there was some causal connection between that she would have been aware of of leaving the gun unsecured and then someone coming behind her and actually loading a prop gun with one live round and that that would result in um, the actor firing that live round into the cinematographer during rehearsal. Um, so I think What's taken the investigation so long, I, I assume, would be trying to find out how that live run got round, got in the gun, and holding that person responsible. Um, I think that's what the, the law enforcement may be focusing on and why we're waiting, you know, months later to find out who, if anyone, is going to be held responsible for, for um, the death of the cinematographer. Yeah, because, Michael, there's no, she didn't think there was live rounds anywhere near the set. Why would she then sit there and, and constantly check? Because that's not a possibility. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, you are working with a live firearm. Whether or not it's loaded with a live round is a different story. But I mean, if that's your job to make sure that this weapon is secured and that it's shooting blank ammunition, not any type of real projectile, you have to take that job very, very seriously, obviously. Otherwise, things like this can happen. I definitely think that, you know, she could be uh, the recipient of some type of civil lawsuit, possibly. But, I, you know, I'm inclined to still agree with Melissa that I don't think that they're going to be able to stretch it to any type of criminal charge. Yeah, and again, the, um, the case is still being investigated by a number of different entities, and uh, at this point, it, that's the classification still under investigation, leaving a lot of people uh, in limbo, including the victim's family members, who, by the way, were very upset by this document dump, uh, saying that it really caught them off guard, and they felt as though um, they should have been consoled a little bit more. We're going to step aside, take a break uh, as we approach the top of the hour. First thing we want to do is thank Michael Bixon for his time uh, and his expertise on this Friday. Michael, have a fantastic weekend. Really appreciate uh, you coming on as always. Coming up, we're going to talk more, of course, about Johnny Depp and how uh, he finishes up on the witness stand. He finished this week. Next week, it's going to be her turn. Amber Heard. We've heard a lot from Johnny Depp about Johnny Depp. We've heard from Johnny Depp's friends. Well, all that is going to be flipped. It's going to be Amber, her friends, the people that believe in her, her story. We're going to get that next week. We'll talk about it when we return. This is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Stay with us. .com and order today. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ted Rollins. Glad to have you along with us on this Friday. The jury's getting a break this morning from hearing testimony in the dueling defamation lawsuits between actor Johnny Depp and his ex-wife Amber Heard. You might be tuning in right now for your fix, thinking, oh, I'm going to sit down and watch the Depp Heard trial. Well, we're still going to talk about it, but testimony won't resume until Monday in Fairfax, Virginia. This morning, the attorneys are working along with the judge meeting without the jury. They're going to go over 
the evidence that will be used in court in the coming days. Depp's legal team is expected to wrap their case in chief early next week. And then that means it's time for Amber Heard and her team to begin presenting evidence of their case. Heard is expected to take the stand next week as the first witness for her case. Depp is suing her, of course, for $50 million. She's countersuing him for $100 million. Here's a look. At week three in testimony in this bitter courtroom showdown between Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. Ms. Heard wasn't the only one who had a problem with your drinking, correct? Sir, so if anyone had a problem with my drinking at any time in my life, it was me. The only person that I have ever abused in my life is myself. I thought you'd be clean and sober to fix a lot of our problems. I've never been clean. I know. In the big picture, the big scheme of things, it is nothing but hurt us. And why? Because a call of the booze doesn't make it easier for you to see how clearly that is. You gotta, you stop. Think you gotta stop with coke. All, all, the coke you, all the coke you've done today and all the booze you've drank today, By the way, has it helped you? I just got Has it helped us? Just got the coke. Has it helped us? Sunday. Yeah, I know because la yesterday you were a thousand times better. What did you say in response when Miss Heard said, tell the world, Johnny, tell them Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, a man, I'm a victim to of domestic violence? I said, yes, I am. And where exactly was the finger in the bar area? Directly below the bar, though. I mean, the bar was set up like a conventional bar uh, that stuck out from a wall. and with a marble top. There was a big chunk out of that as well, like on the st staircase. Directly at the end of the bar, there was a scrunched up piece of kitchen paper, if you like, tissue, um, with lots of blood around it, on it. As a result of the work that you performed, did you form any opinions with respect to Ms. Heard? I did. What were those opinions? I, uh, the results of Ms. Heard's evaluation supported two diagnoses, borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder. It's your understanding that you were supposed to be giving that pamphlet to victims of domestic violence on calls, is that correct? Correct. Did you provide a copy of this pamphlet to Amber Heard? I did not. I did not identify her as a victim of domestic violence. When you saw her at the front desk on March 25th, you didn't see any bruising, correct? Correct. And you didn't see uh, that effect? That's correct. I didn't see any marks or bruises. My understanding is that the language that wound up in the final op-ed piece was very different from the original language that Robin included in the op-ed after um, having uh, spoken with Amber about her personal experiences. And how was it different? Um, it was, it, it did not refer directly to um, Ms. Hurd's relationship with, um, with Johnny Depp. All of the community liabilities that were unresolved, approximately $13.5 million, that Mr. Depp had to pay those liabilities in its entirety. So at that point, she was demanding $14,250,000 of consideration, and then it got worse. He's got a very high tolerance for any substance, Johnny, you know, I would say so, you know. I think uh, Jack Sparrow's more drunk than Johnny Depp, to be honest. <laughs> well, it's probably good that the uh, Friday's off. That was just from this week, all of that. Uh, it started with Johnny Depp on the stand as he concluded his testimony at the beginning of the week. Joining us again, law professor at the University of Georgia and former prosecutor Melissa Redman. She's in Atlanta, Georgia, still with us. And joining our conversation, criminal defense attorney Marie Pereira. She's in New York City. And Marie, you're also uh, certified in domestic violence. This is uh, your wheelhouse. So here we are after a week of Johnny, or three weeks of Johnny Depp's case in chief. It's setting the table for Amber Heard. When dealing with domestic violence victims, um, what is your experience in terms of reaction? There is no set reaction, is there, in terms of, um, okay, the police show up at, at the penthouse and she doesn't cooperate. 
um, the um, shielding and not reporting the alleged abusers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This will all be fleshed out next week, but in your estimation, to what extent should the general public and this jury have an open mind to the reactions of a domestic um, abuse victim? I think we should all have an open mind, and before we decide whether or not Amber Heard is lying, we need to hear her side of the story. Because in my experience, both as a prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney, as well as being a certified DV counselor, I know that there's a cycle of violence, and it does involve denial. It involves fear. Even when you have people around you who try to make you feel comfortable, you can actually be afraid of your aggressor. You're damaged, you're broken, and there are two sides to every story. So I want to wait until I hear Amber's side. Denial is definitely a part of the cycle. Marie, I'll just follow up quickly. Uh, have, you, have you actually seen people make it up, though? Yes, I've seen people on the criminal defense end make up stories, especially people with borderline personality disorders. I've seen situations where I had a woman go to a boyfriend's house, bang on his door, demand to come in, and then she called the police from her cell phone saying he was beating her up. Unbeknownst to her, there was a neighbor looking from a peephole who saw her acting out the entire thing. The poor man never opened the door. So yes, I've seen lies. Melissa, when Amber Heard gets on the stand, uh, it'll likely be a multi-day event. Do you believe uh, at the end of that, the jury and the, and the public, people watching, will have a pretty good idea one way or another in terms of the validity of her stories? I do, just as we saw when Johnny Depp took the stand, the jury's going to determine her credibility, whether she's believable, whether she's able to provide the details that they're looking for for these events. It's not uncommon for there to be no bruises, especially immediately after an incident. But what she can testify is about that power and control, that cycle of violence, her fear, um, contextual details of the event. You know, the what, when, why, who, what she saw, what she felt, all of those details that will make it less likely that this is something she's making up and have her friends testify to that as well. Her behavior after the incident, that evidence of trauma, um, aside from actual bruises and, and marks that are seen with the visible eye, whether she changed her behavior during this relationship or whether she changes her behavior when she's round. Um, her abuser as opposed to when she's alone or with her friends. So I think those are all the things that her team are going to be focused on during her, her presentation of her case. During the past three weeks, there have been some pretty wacky stories um, um, and some video and, and other sort of a, a really unveiling of the life of people in this situation that uh, most of us only think about, uh, possibly. A and one of the more bizarre stories was about an incident about uh, that there was 